Yes, uh, well, thank you for the invitation. Um, extractivism simply refers to a, an economic system in which <clears throat> the, the primary um, activity involves extracting natural resources and exporting them uh, elsewhere. Um, usually, uh, we're thinking about mining, uh, the extraction of minerals, um, but uh, we also use extractivism to think about uh, uh, drilling for oil and gas. Um, and of late, uh, we've also started thinking about large-scale agriculture as a form of extractivism, <clears throat> particularly with uh, soy in parts of South America, because uh, very similar to minerals, uh, soy is uh, produced in large scale and extracted elsewhere for uh, use as animal feed. So all of these are, are, are economic forms that we refer to as extractivist uh, systems. Places that have been affected by it in Latin America include virtually everywhere in, in Central and South America. Uh, some cases it's more apparent, uh, more dominant than others. Uh, if uh, you think about places with lots of minerals in the Andes, Peru, Chile, and Bolivia, or oil, Venezuela, Ecuador, Colombia, or a combination of those uh, like Bolivia um, uh, or Brazil, um, in some form or another, uh, almost every country has been impacted by uh, extractivist uh, economic systems. Uh, well, in, in Latin America, since the colonial period, I'm referring to the, the invasion of uh, Latin America by, by Spain and Portugal, uh, since that period, uh, right up through the present, uh, foreign capital has treated the region as a source of raw materials for capitalist growth elsewhere. Uh, first it was Spain, then it was Britain, then it was the United States. And that longer history of uh, extracting natural resources set up systems of, of infrastructures, uh, systems of government, legal systems, um, infrastructures of transportation, uh, uh, forms of, of, of controlling labor, uh, all of which were, were, were sort of rooted in, in, in this economic pattern. And uh, over time, that pattern has been very difficult to break. Um, right up through the present. Uh, some countries uh, like Argentina and Brazil have been able to diversify their economies, industrialize parts of, of the economy, create uh, manufacturing, uh, and in some ways have, have uh, lessened the impact of, of extractive economic systems, or at least dependence on one or two crops or, or exports. Uh, but other countries like Bolivia, uh, Venezuela, Ecuador, um, have not been able to diversify their economies and remain uh, trapped, we could say, on, uh, on one or two main exports. Um, and you know, why is this the case? Why don't, you know, why don't countries change? Well, it has to do with collaboration between national elites who benefit from this system and foreign capital, which also uses debt and uh, selective investment to, to reproduce the system. If you look at Bolivia over the years, uh, uh, what capital is invested in or what uh, foreign loans from institutions like the World Bank are invested in, they invest in infrastructures to reproduce systems of extraction uh, because uh, that's what produces uh, money that can uh, then be repatriated to the source of capital, in, in the case of the United States, to, to Wall Street, we should say. Um, so it's very difficult to break the cycle. When movements have arisen, uh, revolutionary movements have arisen to try to break free from these, these forms of dependence, uh, this is what has generated uh, coups, uh, interventions, uh, and, and other forms of, of pressure to, to, uh, to maintain the system. Well, the, the, the 
different criticisms of extractivism revolve around different dimensions of its impacts. Uh, so on one level, the, the perhaps the most uh, prominent one that we think about is the environmental impact. Uh, mining creates incredible amounts of toxicity, both for nature and for, for people in areas of mining. Uh, oil, of course, is uh, uh, oil and gas or fossil fuels that contribute to global warming, but also create toxic effects locally. Um, so the, the environmental question is often the one that's most prominent. Of course, we have deforestation as well in the case of large scale soy expansion. Um, but extractivism also creates other sorts of impacts on societies that are also a reason to that we should be thinking critically about it. Um, uh, primarily, um, the, the, the economic impacts of, of, of dependence on one or two uh, exports uh, uh, generate inequality. They do not produce large amounts of, of jobs. Uh, they concentrate wealth in cities. Um, they displace people from the countryside uh, or the uh, uh, impacts of, of large scale mining, for example, uh, displaces people from agricultural regions or takes water away from people uh, who need it for agricultural practices. So economic inequality is an impact of extractivism. Um, another impact that uh, we talk about is, is because of the, the way that extractivism replicates a colonial form of economic domination. So when we say colonial, we mean coming in from the outside, uh, setting up a system that is designed to remove wealth from the earth and take it somewhere else. Uh, this is basically what extractivism is. And that's a system that also is rooted in a very patriarchal form of, of domination, masculine conquest of, of nature. And in, in different ways, uh, we can also draw lines of connection between uh, extractive economic systems and various forms of violence against uh, women. Uh, so there's a, there's a, there's that component to it as well, and finally for uh, indigenous peoples uh, whose lands are all often uh, on the frontiers, so to speak, of uh, of uh, these countries, uh, extractive systems have had a major impact not just on environment, on health and well-being, but on their rights, uh, and this is uh, one of the the, the major issues, a uh, place like Argentina, where fracking has impacted indigenous rights, Chile, uh, Bolivia, of course, uh, all of these places, extractivism represents a, a colonial an expansion of that colonial dispossession of native peoples. So that's the, the different ways of, of thinking that why we should think critically. Now, can countries uh, not extract natural resources? Well, there's something where you have to have a, a more sort of realistic sense. Uh, uh, human beings cannot survive without using something from nature, but it's the form uh, that that is done in and the ways that that wealth is uh, reinvested or not in a society. So uh, it is the case that we may not ever uh, avoid uh, mining thinking about transitioning to renewable energy. If we're to do that, we're going to have to mine something. Uh, uh, if we're going to communicate over Skype, there are uh, elements in these computers and technologies that come out of the earth. So um, at least for any sort of short or medium term, there's going to be extractivism of some form. The question becomes, can governments uh, do something to transform the way that it's done and to ameliorate these uh, effects. Uh, and that's an open question and it's a difficult uh, question uh, uh, for, for countries that depend on uh, these products for uh, income. I think it's it's certainly realistic to imagine a different future uh, uh, because the the current form 
the violences that it produces are, are, are not sustainable. There would be no reason to, to, to defend and say, no, the system will just stay as it is. So, uh, and certainly some countries that have been able to uh, avoid the, uh, this kind of dependence have done so by redistributing land, uh, promoting small and medium scale forms of agriculture rather than subsidizing large scale industries, um, uh, using uh, investing in uh, industries that uh, or investing in uh, diversification of the economy. So, for example, in Bolivia, we see on a very small scale efforts to expand organic agriculture, uh, alternative crops, uh, uh, smaller and medium scale uh, cooperatives that uh, would both be able to produce uh, a, a good, uh, but uh, not concentrate the, the, the land or the wealth in the hands of a few people. Um, in terms of oil and gas, of course, the entire planet needs to stop extracting oil and gas. Uh, and certainly in a place like Bolivia, there's uh, plenty of uh, solar resources, one might say, if, if you will, uh, that they could envision and, and, and a renewable uh, energy system. Um, the, the, the problem is, is that uh, countries are dependent on uh, uh, the dollar. And to generate uh, income in dollars, uh, you have to have something that will bring dollars into the country. And a lot of people who say, you know, the alternative to extractivism, let's promote uh, ecotourism. Well, tourism is a, a kind of a colonial economic system itself in many ways. And, uh, you know, if you, if you think of a country like uh, Costa Rica, which has been able to uh, avoid this kind of dependence, has actually made great strides toward renewable energy. Uh, uh, it's relatively prosperous compared to other Central American countries. And it has uh, a, a very robust uh, uh, environmental conservation system, a lot of which re revolves around its, its tourist industry. Um, so that, that's one thing that some critics have said, and, and I'm sort of, uh, ambivalent about that because, uh, as I say, tourism is, is kind of a, yet another form in which uh, uh, wealthier people from elsewhere come and consume, uh, consume nature or consume labor uh, from poorer people, in, in, as it would be in the case of Bolivia. So it, it, there's no easy answer to it. Um, and this is sort of the, the, the dilemma we're in today. Certainly both sides, you know, as I said before, the system is not simply imposed on countries. Uh, elites, uh, national capitalists, uh, all participate in the system and help to reproduce it. So uh, it's not sort of an either or situation. Um, certainly uh, large scale mining companies, say in Canada, uh, should be uh, uh, held accountable. Um, in uh, Europe, uh, Companies like Repsol in, in Spain has been the main, one of the largest uh, gas companies in Bolivia. Um, uh, certainly they should be held accountable for it. Um, in the case of the United States, it's, uh, as I said before, those who invest in these systems, uh, they should be held accountable for it. Um, and so I, I, I don't think it's an either or situation. For those of us who aren't from Latin America, I certainly think it's more of our concern to hold our capitalist uh, industries and investors to account than it is for us to tell Bolivians what they should be doing. Um, that's uh, sort of the position I have. So um, I'm not sure if that answers the question, but uh, there are certainly many people, uh, many institutions that uh, participate in the system and that, uh, that are to blame, so to speak. I think another element is, uh, Overconsumption in general. Um, I mean, this is a more radical uh, 
future that's hard to think about, but you know, thinking from a perspective of the Earth's systems, uh, we need to move towards slow or no growth um, so that uh, uh, consumerism itself is a problem, uh, especially the, the hyper levels of consumption that we have in the global north. Um, and so that uh, is something that, that, that is also to, to blame for these systems. And if, you know, if we get more into different aspects of different extractive systems, you know, one of the big problems with soy is that it largely goes to feed cattle. Um, we should probably stop eating cattle. Um, these kinds of connections uh, are all part of the, the broader problem. The easy answer for that is yes. Uh, I don't know how to, to elaborate more on that, um, uh, but certainly that, uh, that is, that's the answer, yes. Certainly in, uh, in Bolivia, which for the past 15 years or so has been able to use the resources of, of natural gas to uh, invest, <clears throat> invest in people uh, with some success, uh, the natural gas is now running out. Um, the reserves are dwindling and it's not, uh, it's pretty clear that that period of, of boom is, is coming to an end. So the question now is, what does Bolivia do? Um, and the dilemma that, that the new government of Bolivia, which is a progressive leaning government faces is, uh, well, should we try fracking? Uh, fracking is a way of getting more gas out of more difficult underground formations. It's more expensive, it's more toxic, uh, uses more water. It's absolutely, uh, absolutely awful. Um, and that would be a, a, a pretty bad decision, I would say, uh, for Bolivia. Um, should it encourage uh, the expansion of the soy industry? You know, you're basically, so you have a left-leaning uh, government that is uh, confronted with the possibility of having, having to support uh, the most right-wing component of the society, which are the large-scale agriculturalists, uh, in order to eke out some sort of revenue from the export of soy. Uh, or should they promote lithium? This is one of the, the new dreams in Bolivia is that lithium will, will, will be the key to the future. And there, there we might have some possibility for uh, industrializing on some scale if Bolivia is able to uh, uh, set up its own production of batteries and perhaps even production of electric vehicles or components for electric vehicles we might be able to see some form of industrialization. There are plenty of environmental risks for lithium extraction. Um, and in fact, it's a, a German company that is uh, uh, currently hoping to work with Bolivia on uh, lithium extraction, among others. There are also Chinese uh, investors involved as well. So, um, so this is the dilemma. Um, it is not an easy, it is not an easy uh, situation to exit from when you have a relatively uh, poor country uh, and with immediate needs, and you have systems set up that have long relied on revenues coming from these economic activities, it is not a simple thing to say, well, we're not going to do that anymore, no matter what side of the, the ideological spectrum you, you, you're on. The one, uh, the one positive thing that we can say about the, the past few years of Bolivia is that they radically changed uh, the, 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 the proportion of wealth that stayed in the country from gas. And 
rather than stealing it, which happens in much of the world, they actually invested it and used it to 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 create uh, uh, circulate wealth. Now, one could criticize that and say, well, as soon as the gas runs out, then that system's going to run out. Uh, nonetheless, they did a lot better than uh, pretty much every other government that's ever existed in Bolivia in addressing poverty. So that's the other side of the coin. Well, we're already seeing the, the effects of that in, uh, in combination with the effects of global warming which have, and global warfare, which have sparked large-scale immigration to the global north. So <clears throat> the, the patterns of environmental destruction, and social displacement, uh, political warfare, and, 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 and you know, pushing people out or making their lives unlivable uh, has created what we are seeing already happening, which is migration to uh, places where the wealth is. It's absolutely understandable. So, um, you know, this this model of sort of exhausting nature, uh, well, if you run its course, you know, Marx said that you know, the exhaustion of, of labor was, would basically lead to the end of capitalism, but in fact, it might be the exhaustion of nature that comes first. And so uh, I hate to be pessimistic because I have children and I would like to think that their future is uh, uh, not one of gloom and doom and an environmental apocalypse. Uh, but uh, if we don't start changing uh, something fairly quickly, that might actually be the case for all of us. Well, I think that, that the role of grassroots activism is, is central. Um, that's the only way change will happen. Uh, and I talk to my students about this when we talk about fossil fuels. Uh, there's a kind of a complacency, especially among people who live comfortably, who don't suffer the impacts of, or at least suffer directly the impacts of extractive economies, uh, to think that things are okay and that uh, policymakers will sort things out or or the markets will sort things out, or you know, the scientists will come up with something to fix these problems. And uh, none of that is true, because as I said before, when, when, the, when the infrastructures and political systems and technological systems are set up to, to reproduce dependence on something like fossil fuels, that system in itself is incapable of changing itself. It does not want to change itself because that's how it how it accumulates wealth. So the challenge has to come from the grassroots. It has to come externally. It won't come from the the, the engineers and, and and the politicians and and the business people who uh, are basically they are the system. Uh, so this is uh, what we've seen uh, with the growing global uh, action on climate change. It's come from the grassroots, and it will have to keep coming from the grassroots. Um, in terms of Latin America, there's a bit uh, of uh, more of a challenge in places like Bolivia, which still have uh, uh, a significant amount of the population which is not prosperous and comfortable. And um, in fact, in Bolivia, the grassroots movements actually mobilized to demand the extraction of natural gas. They wanted national control over that wealth, but there was, there was virtually no opposition to the extraction of natural gas because it is seen as the possibility of addressing poverty. So there's a very different dynamic uh, in a place like Bolivia where um, grassroots activism against extractivism is relatively small. Uh, there is certainly a growing consciousness that the extractive industries are to blame for many social and environmental problems, uh, but because of that longer history of dependence, uh, it, it, it 
it's it's very difficult for those organizations, those environmental organizations, to get political traction on a national level. Um, uh, it, it's only now that uh, uh, communities are seeing direct impacts, say, with uh, the pollution of water or water scarcity, that you can make linkages between those who are directly impacted and those environmentalist movements that have long been calling attention to it. So in the case of Bolivia, we certainly are starting to see uh, uh, communities that are opposed to the expansion of mining. We're seeing that in Ecuador and Peru as well. Um, uh, so those kinds of connections between the communities that are directly impacted and those uh, usually urban environmentalists or urban activists uh, are starting to emerge. And uh, we're also seeing some recognition of those other elements that I mentioned uh, tied to patriarchy and, and violence against women that are recognizing that, that uh, 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 feminist critique uh, goes hand in hand with a critique of extractivism. And so you see the possibility of articulation between uh, those types of movements and environmental movements and indigenous or rural movements coming together. That's what I think is, is the, the, the future of possibilities. So that's, that's, I think, where real critical thinking uh, can emerge. Uh, well, uh, Kill your car, <laughs> uh, consume less, um, uh, participate in activities like this where we can educate each other about what's happening elsewhere, uh, hold your own governments to account when they interfere in other places, hold your own industries to account. Um, you know, one of the curious things about the recent coup in Bolivia in 2019 was the relative silence of the European Union on a brutal military regime that emerged, uh, it was a militarized regime, I should say, uh, had civilians in sort of the front, but uh, uh, a brutal uh, military and police repression. And uh, Europe is uh, relatively silent uh, on that. Uh, same thing goes with Venezuela. You know, everyone is, uh, everyone in the, the global north, you know, tied to the interests of Western capital or uh, trying to get regime change in Venezuela. And they've demonized Chavez and demonized Maduro, uh, but uh, they haven't really questioned why the country is suffering. And it's because of oil. It's not because of any one thing Maduro or Chavez did. It's because of oil. And the global north doesn't really want a regime change that we really would like to think about in a place like Venezuela, which is a change away from dependence on oil. Uh, the United States especially simply wants to make Venezuela an easier place for uh, Western oil companies to do business. That's the primary motivation. And uh, people in the global north need to stop buying these stories about you know, the evils of Maduro or Chavez and, and think more critically about what's going on. And we could say the same thing about the Middle East as well. So that's... Uh, I could go on and on and on, but uh, those are some things I would say. True democracy needs an informed public. A public where individuals recognize the value of information. Information that has been put into the right context. A context that challenges our convictions. And convictions that are not dogmatic, but that we are capable of developing. If we combine these elements, we can revitalize and strengthen one of the most important pillars of our democracy, journalism, the fourth estate, to help find solutions and build bridges rather than divide and marginalize. This is our vision as an independent, non-profit media portal. To ensure that we can remain independent and stay true to our vision, we do not accept any advertising or funding from corporations or governments. Our journalism depends entirely on you, the public, to stay alive. Social change thrives on participation. Become part of the change. 
If each of our subscribers donates only 3 to 5 euros per month, then together we will be able to create a network that makes a valuable contribution to opinion making. All of these small contributions come together to create something big.